This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. The title of this episode is called Tips on How to Talk to Trinitarians About John Chapter 1. Many Trinitarians, when they first hear that a person doesn't believe that God is a Trinity, they'll think right away, well, what about John Chapter 1? John Chapter 1 is like the best evidence somehow that Jesus is God and therefore God is a Trinity. And I've been thinking about John Chapter 1 now for several years and had some conversations with Trinitarians. And there's a few things that I think can help a person perhaps see John chapter 1 in a new light. So I wanted to talk about a few of those things, and some of this will be reviewing things said in former podcasts too, but I thought it'd be good to kind of get a few tips all together here. Now the key verses for Trinitarians in John chapter 1 are, of course, John 1, 1, and then John 1, 14. John 1 1 starts out, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And for the Trinitarian, that is a declaration that Jesus is a second God figure, divine figure, in addition to the Father. I knew as a Trinitarian, and I found as I speak to Trinitarians now, that most Trinitarians don't have any idea about God bringing about the new creation through Jesus the Messiah. And this is a key point in describing or explaining this understanding of John 1.1. The phrase, in the beginning, for the Trinitarian world is a direct reference to the Genesis creation. So I think it's important to explain to a Trinitarian person that, hey, through Jesus the Messiah, God has done something new. There's a new beginning in the man Jesus. And it would make sense that this is what the Gospel of John is describing, a new beginning. Yes, sure, John uses some language from Genesis creation here, but not a lot, actually. And there's some very different language between the two chapters, Genesis chapter 1 and John chapter 1. But the author is intentionally using some Genesis language here to show the continuity between the God who created the heavens and the earth in Genesis chapter 1 and the God who is at work in Jesus to bring about new life in John chapter 1. So the big question then is, which beginning is John chapter 1 directly referring to? And I think there's several ways in which you can get a person to think, oh, yeah, this is a different beginning than the Genesis chapter 1 creation. And the first thing is to note how the phrase, the beginning, is used in the Gospel of John itself. Now, of course, when we're talking to people, it's going to be hard to remember references, but it would be a good idea to know some of these references, or at least the content of a few other references associated with the beginning in the Gospel of John. I'll I'll mention a few here, John chapter 8, verse 25, where people ask Jesus, who are you? And Jesus said to them, even what I have told you from the beginning. So this is obviously a reference to the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And John fifteen twenty seven, where Jesus speaks to the apostles, and he says, You also are witnesses, because you have been with me from the beginning. So here we're looking at the Gospel of John to see the phrase, the beginning, is not referring to the Genesis creation, but to the beginning of, in the life and ministry of Jesus, the Messiah. Here's another one, John 16, 4. Jesus says to the apostles, I have said these things to you, that when the hour comes, 
you may remember that I told you of them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. He's getting ready to leave them. So we're letting the Gospel of John help us understand what the phrase the beginning or in the beginning is here in his own gospel, within the gospel of John itself. And then I think it's important to point out that the other gospels as well all have a beginning at the beginning of their gospel, which is associated with the beginning of the life and ministry of Jesus. So it makes sense that John is like the other gospels describing the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Here's the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's Mark's beginning. And the Gospel of Luke, too, has a beginning. In Luke, chapter 1, verse 2, he says that things were delivered by those who from the beginning, that's the apostles, who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So once again, here we see a beginning associated with the life and the ministry of Jesus and his apostles. And the Gospel of Matthew starts out with a beginning. It's not as direct here, but Matthew starts out by saying, the book of the genesis of Jesus Christ, the the genealogy, the origin of Jesus Christ. This is the beginning, and it's traced back to Jesus' physical descendancy through David and Abraham. So all the other Gospels have a beginning And it would be strange to think that the Gospel of John's beginning is different from the other three Gospels. Then, we can see how the phrase, in the beginning, is used in other places in the Bible as well, to reference not the Genesis creation, but other new beginnings, other beginnings, like Acts chapter 11, verse 15, when Peter is explaining to the other Jews in Jerusalem what happened with the Gentile Cornelius in Caesarea, He says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us in the beginning or at the beginning. It's the exact same phrase in John chapter 1. So the phrase the beginning needs context. I might say, let me tell you what happened in the beginning. And you might think I'm talking about the creation of the universe, but it might also be in context, the beginning of the relationship with my wife. So, as well, in the Gospel of John, we need context to know what beginning is discussed here. Paul uses the exact same phrase, in the beginning, in Philippians 4.15. He says, in the beginning of the Gospel, when I left Macedonia. So, here, Paul's beginning is a different one, when he first started to preach the Gospel in Greece. So, the beginning of the baptism of John, the ministry of Jesus, the apostles see as a new beginning. I think we can see the same idea in the epistle of 1 John, chapter 1, verse 1, where the author talks about the beginning concerning the word of life, and it involved something and someone that the apostles heard and saw and touched. Obviously, that beginning is with the man, Jesus, who was living among them. So the idea that John is presenting a new beginning here is very important because if the Gospel of John chapter 1 is about the new beginning in Jesus Christ and is not a direct reference, it's only an echo of the Genesis creation, if this is about the new beginning in Jesus Christ, all this speculation about another divine figure involved in the Genesis creation Like I said in the previous podcast, it's barking up the wrong tree. You've got the wrong creation. John chapter 1 is about the new beginning, the new creation that God is working through the man Jesus Christ, through the human being Jesus Christ. Now, in some of the discussions I've had with Trinitarians, when I tell them this, I can see, wow, they're thinking about it because they haven't heard this before. But if we can explain to people that The Gospel of John is about the new beginning, that God is at work in and through the man Jesus. I've seen it makes people think a little bit. It doesn't mean that right away they say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it makes them think a little bit. And if if they want to think more about it, they will. A lot of people just don't want to think about it because they still think, oh, if you don't think Jesus is God, you're going to hell forever and ever and ever. But for those that want to know the truth, and I hope that the fact that 
they're missing out on the meaning of John chapter one and really what the whole gospel is about. They're deflecting the meaning of John chapter one to some discussion about the Genesis creation and a second figure who is also God somehow who created the universe. And they miss out on what God is really communicating here in John chapter one and that there's a new beginning. There's new life in the man Jesus. I hope they don't miss out on that new life by ignoring and deflecting what God is really presenting to us here in John chapter 1. So I think this is very important. And doesn't it make sense that God is doing something with Jesus that, yes, has continuity with what God has done in the past, but is new with Jesus? And that's why Jesus is called the Word here, because God in the past created through his word and worked through his word, did things through his word. And that's what he's doing here now with Jesus beginning in the first century AD. So the idea of the new beginning, the new creation, is what is being presented here in the Gospel of John. And by the way, that's the same with the other passages that Trinitarians also think somehow show that Jesus was involved in the Genesis creation, but he's really involved in the new creation. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, for instance. But you can see Jesus is the firstborn of creation. He's the firstborn of the resurrection from the dead. Things come to be through him, yes. New life comes to be through him. New authorities come to be through him. Hebrews chapter 1, the same thing. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus Christ is, quote, the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead ones. And Revelation chapter 3, 14 describes Jesus as the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. So we have the parallels and confirmation from other New Testament literature that Jesus is the beginning of God's new creation. Resurrection from the dead is new creation, and the new creation of life comes through him. So here are just a few other ways to be able to show that it's not the creation of Genesis that's being described in John 1. By the way, there's no, the word create is not in the Gospel of John chapter 1. It might be in some English translations, but the Greek word for create, it's not there. It's simply not there. So that's strange. If John chapter 1 is talking about the Genesis creation, the word to create, it's not there. Things come to be in John chapter 1. Things are made, you might even say, but it's really the word to come to be. And what comes to be in John chapter 1 is life. This is the main thrust of the gospel of John, the coming to be of new life. The subject of what comes to be is not the seas the dry land, plants, animals, planets, stars, or the sun in John chapter 1. But it's human life, individually, and I'll suggest corporately as well. Corporately, because the word world in John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, the true light that was coming into the world and the world that came to be through him, this is not planet Earth. This is the word cosmos, and it's a word which means a segment of human society. So John 1 is not about the material world coming to be. It's about human life coming to be and how a person can be born of God and to become part of the family of God. See John chapter 1, verse 12 to 13, all those who are born of God. This is the subject of of John chapter 1 and of the gospel of John. It's not the creation of planets and seas and dry land. We can see that it's life, human life, that's coming to be in the gospel of John. If we look at verses 3 and 4, again, sometimes the issue is translation, but verse 3 says that all things, the word things is not in the Greek text, it's simply all, all came to be through him. And without him, nothing came to be. And then there's a textual issue. If the last part of verse 3 goes with verse 4, I think it does. I think what it's really saying is that which came to be in him, 
was life. That's what he's talking about. This is the all that came to be in him. That which came to be in him was life. And even if, if you just take the beginning of verse 4, as most English translations have it, in him was life. It's life that comes to be. This is the topic of John chapter 1. I like to say, put John chapter 1, verse 1 through 18, next to Genesis 1, 1 through 18, and see if you think it's really talking about the same subject. It's not. John is simply appropriating some of the Genesis language to say that the God who created in Genesis is now at work again through the man Jesus to bring about life. It's life coming to be. That is the topic of John 1. It's new life coming to be through the man, Jesus Christ. So it's not the created earth that comes to be in John chapter 1, the world. It's not, the, it's not planet earth. This is a segment of human society. John chapter 1 is about life for humans, how a person can be born of God and to become part of the family of God. Now, this, a second way I think we can show people that John 1 is not about the Genesis creation, but it is about the new beginning, the new creation that God is working through Jesus, is this phrase in John chapter 1, verse 4, and the life was the light of men. Okay, so although Genesis creation language is being intentionally used, this is not Genesis creation life or Genesis creation, light. Now think about this. In the book of Genesis, which comes first? Light or life? It's light, right? God said, let there be light. First thing he said. And so light is first in the book of Genesis. Then life comes later. But in the gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 4, it's life that comes first. And that life is the light for all humankind. So this is talking about the man Jesus. In him comes to be life. That's first. And the life of the resurrected from the dead man, Jesus Christ, is light for all men. Hope for all men that we as well can be raised from the dead. So this is another way to see that the Gospel of John, chapters 1, here we're talking about verses 3 and 4. It's not talking about Genesis creation. It's talking about the new life in the man, Jesus Christ that comes to be through the man, Jesus Christ, who's metaphorically called the Word. Just like life came through God's Word in Genesis, so life comes through God's Word, the man Jesus, in the Gospel of John. Now, another way that we can see that the Gospel of John chapter 1 is not about the Genesis creation, that it's about the new beginning in the life of Jesus, is the fact that John the baptizer is so prominently and so early introduced in this chapter. In verses 6 to 8, already John the baptizer is introduced and testifying to the true light, the man, Jesus Christ, who in the gospel we learn is the light of the world. He came into the world as light. This is the man, Jesus Christ. And John the baptizer is introduced very early. Why? Because people at the time were wondering about the relationship between John the baptizer and Jesus. Was John the baptizer the Christ? Who's more prominent, Jesus or, or John the baptizer? So this gospel very quickly clarifies the relationship between Jesus and John the baptizer. John the baptizer has no reason to be in a Genesis creation account in verse 6. This is a new creation, a new beginning in the man Jesus. And John's presence here in this gospel early and often is evidence that we are talking here about a new beginning, a new creation in the man Jesus. Actually, the whole prologue can be understood as a clarification of the relationship between the man Jesus and John the baptizer. Even in verse 1, this is perhaps already a comparison. We'll get to verse 1, but in verses 1 and 2, I think there's already a comparison between the man Jesus and John the baptizer. Okay, so this is not Genesis creation. When the gospel writer says that the word was with God, this is a unique relationship that the man Jesus has with God. And then in verse 2 where he says, this one was in the beginning with God. Well, that's a comparison 
with verse 7, where it starts out with the exact same pronoun. This one came for testimony. John the Baptist, this one came for testimony. So if you read John chapter 1, even the continuation, look at verse 19 and following, it's all about John the Baptizer's testimony to who Jesus is. So the whole prologue is as well. John the Baptizer is in verse 6 through 8. He's in verse 15. The prologue may be a little bit more of a kind of an abstract comparison between Jesus and John the Baptist. And then in verse 19 and following in the rest of John chapter 1 is the more narrative description of the relationship of Jesus and John the Baptist. But the whole prologue can be seen in the backdrop of the Jesus and John the Baptist clarification. It's not a description of the Genesis creation. And by the way, this is another thing to note, and of course you start to get off track a little bit, but Trinitarian scholars, they realize that the Gospel of John is introducing a new creation. Former podcasts, I've quoted some of these Trinitarians where people like F.F. F. Bruce and Leon Morris, who wrote a commentary on the Gospel of John, even James White in his book, The Forgotten Trinity. These commentators recognize that the beginning in Genesis is about the creation of the material world or an organization of the material world. And John chapter 1 is about the redemption, the renewal of that world, specifically of the redemption or new creation of people, of humans. Here's James White in his book, The Forgotten Trinity, page 45, quote, Just as Genesis introduces God's work of creation, so John 1.1 1, 1 introduces God's work of redeeming that people. And that work has been going on just as long as creation itself. He recognizes it. Then he forgets what he says and misinterprets the rest of the chapter. It's the work of God's redeeming that people. New creation is the work of redemption. So that's what John 1 is about. They can see that. This is about life coming to be, new life coming to be, being born of God. All of these ideas, a new community of God, a new family of God coming to be. This is not about the Genesis creation in John chapter 1. So again, if a person can see that the beginning here is not a direct reference to the Genesis creation. By the way, it's not even really the beginning, and you could translate this as at a beginning or at the beginning. The definite article is not in either the Hebrew Genesis or the John chapter 1. You don't have the there. This could be translated at the beginning or at a beginning. But once a person sees that John 1 is describing the new beginning that God's bringing about through Jesus, the Messiah, all of a sudden light bulbs will start to come on. They'll see, oh yeah, this is parallel to Colossians chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 1, the new creation that God's bringing about. This is not about the old Genesis creation. Now, there, of course, there are other issues in the Gospel of John, but if you can explain that some, I think you'll find people are willing to listen and of course, we don't, we don't get mad. We don't have to get all flustered with their inability maybe to understand this at first. People are going to stick with what they want to believe in, in any case. But there's going to be people that are willing to listen. There's people that respect the scriptures enough that will listen to this. So let's get to the rest of the text of John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1 1, 1 is often broken down into three parts. John 1.1a, 1, 1 in the beginning was the word. And then 11b, and the word was with God. And then 11c, and the word was God. John 11a, in the beginning was the word. Now, I believe that people are right in recognizing that the word is a metaphorical title for Jesus. Now, it's not a pre incarnate second divine God figure, but it's the man, Jesus Christ, who is called the word here. One thing that I think is important to point out in any passage of the scripture that somebody wants to interpret as meaning the deity of Christ or that Jesus is a pre-incarnate God or divine person who now will take on a human body, like the Trinitarian interpretation of John 1, these deity of Christ interpretations are a denigration of the human person. 
Jesus of Nazareth. Actually, it's an elimination of the human person, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, I probably didn't realize that I was doing that when I was a Trinitarian, interpreting John 1 as a God person somehow becoming a man. But if we're going to say that God entered into human flesh or God took on human flesh, this is the cost, the elimination of the human person, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Otherwise, Jesus would be two persons, a God person and a human person. For the Trinitarian, the person is that preexistent God person, not the human person, Jesus the Messiah from Nazareth. Now, John 1, 1 b continues, the word was with God. This is a phrase that can be understood as a unique relationship that the man Jesus had with God while he was on the earth. Just like Moses, there's parallels with the man Moses in this first verse. Now, that's the book of Exodus. That's not Genesis. We've got typology parallels with the Old Testament. Quite a few parallels in the Gospel of John with the Old Testament, not just Genesis, but as well Exodus. Moses is a man who is with God. He was on the mountain. He had a special relationship with God. He had a mediatorial relationship between the people and God, as Jesus does. The phrase was with God is interesting because it's really a Greek preposition that means toward or in the direction of oriented toward. Usually a word is something that comes out from God. But here it is with God in the sense of being toward God. This is another indication that a person is being described here metaphorically by the word word, logos. And I think as well, the Gospel of John is saying this because he's comparing, he's already starting to tell us that Jesus is preeminent to John the baptizer. John 1, 1 b and the Logos was with God, is basically repeated and emphasized in verse 2. This one was in the beginning with God. Compare that to John the baptizer in verse 7. This one was not the light, but came to bear witness. Let's note that the Gospel of John declares two times in the first two verses that the Logos was with God. This emphasis differentiates the Logos from God. The Logos is differentiated from God, not just from the Father. He doesn't say the Logos was with the Father, but was with God two times here. Just like Jesus differentiated himself from God quite often in the Gospel of John. Not just from the Father, but from God. Believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus said. The differentiation is between the Logos and God, two times within the first two verses of the book. And then in the third phrase of John chapter 1, called John 1, 1, C, you have this phrase, the word was God. And for most of the Trinitarian world, then they think that this is a declaration that Jesus is deity, ontologically God, ontologically means having to do with being, or in essence, or in nature. This is supposedly a claim that Jesus was deity. So, is John making a statement about the essence, or the being, of the Logos here? That the Logos was literally deity? Let's take a look at a few other ways, and I would suggest better ways to understand the phrase, the Logos was God. But before we do, we can point out another problem with the Trinitarian interpretation of John 1.1, 1, 1, and that is they change the meaning of the word God here. You can ask a Trinitarian, you say, okay, let's read this. You say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now, is God the Trinity there? No, he's not the Trinity. God there is the Father. Okay, that's right. But as a Trinitarian, why are you assuming that the first occurrence of God in the gospel is the Father? Maybe God there should be the Spirit. You see, they're coming to this text with presuppositions. And why not the Trinity? Why isn't the first occurrence of the word God in this gospel 
Why doesn't it mean the Trinity? And the word was God. Okay, now is the Logos the Father to the Trinitarian? And they say, no, no, no. The Logos is not the Father. In their mind, the Logos is, quote, God the Son. It's not the Father. So now they've got to change already the meaning of the word God to the Trinitarian deity of Christ believer, God, in the phrase, and the Logos was with God, is the Father. But in the very next phrase, the same word, God, is not the Father. That's a problem. It's a big problem. Because when one looks at John 1.1 1, 1 in the Greek text, there's only one little word separating the two occurrences of God. It's the word and. If you can, I recommend taking a look at John 1.1 1, 1 in an interlinear Bible, where one can see both the Greek and English or whatever other language together, on a website like Bible Hub. In Greek, the word order of John 1.1 1, 1 is like this. The Logos was with God, and God was the Logos. A person is going to have to bring presuppositions to the text to make the two occurrences of God, Theos, in John 1.1, 1, 1, separated by the little word and, to mean two different things. Again, to the Trinitarian, God is the Father in John 1.1b, 1, 1, but God is not the Father in John 1.1c. 1, 1, Actually, to the Trinitarian, John 1.1c, 1, 1, God was the Logos, or the Logos was God, doesn't really even mean the Son. It means deity. This is what the Trinitarian interpretation of John 1.1 1, 1 has to do. God in John 1.1 1, 1 are two different meanings for the Trinitarian. And the Logos was with the Father, and the Logos was deity for the Trinitarian. If God in the word was God means the Father, then Trinitarianism is dead. God in John 1.1c 1, 1 and the word was God for the Trinitarian can't mean the Father. But there's no good reason for believing that it doesn't mean the Father. The word was God. But this doesn't mean that Jesus was literally deity, that he was the Father. New Testament Greek language commentators see that there's something indirect in this statement. The Logos was God. Our suggestions are going to be that it's not God literally visiting or coming to his people, but God did so in the person of the Messiah, Jesus. The one God, the Father, was at work in and through the Messiah, the human person, Jesus of Nazareth. So what does this mean, the word was God? Well, I would ask the Trinitarian, who is God in this book, over and over and over again? And which God, or who is the God in Jesus? And we should know John chapter 17, verse 3, where Jesus himself says that the Father is the only true God. So in this gospel, there is no God the Son or God the Word. Nowhere. The God of the Gospel of John is the Father. What John chapter 1 is doing, he's introducing already the idea that it's the Father in Jesus. It's good to know a few of these verses where we see it's the Father in Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 38, for example, Jesus is talking about how the works that he does testify to who he is. He says he does these works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me. In John chapter 14, Jesus says, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. The Father who dwells in me does his works. Let me for a moment emphasize John chapter 14, verse 10. Because I think if a person can understand what Jesus said in John 14, 10, 
Then you'll understand better John 1 1 and John 1 14. This is the night before Jesus was crucified, and he says to the apostles, after Philip had asked Jesus to show them the Father, Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. But then John 14 10, Jesus said, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. That's John 14.10. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Okay, that section of scripture explains exactly what the author meant when he said the word was God. It's the Father in Jesus, not in an ontological way, in the sense of nature or deity. It's the one God, the Father, working in the human person, Jesus of Nazareth, who was born in Bethlehem. Jesus says, it's the Father who dwells in me, does his works. The Father is dwelling in Jesus. This is why the author can say, the word was God, because the Father is dwelling in Jesus. I'll say this again. If the word was God, the Logos was God of John 1.1c, 1, 1 means the Father, Trinitarianism, and actually Arianism as well, are dead. For the deity of Christ interpretation to be correct, or for the Arian interpretation to be correct, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, the God in 1.1c, 1, 1 the word was God, can't be the Father. They have to change the meaning of the word God from John 1.1b, 1, 1 and the word was with God, to 1.1c, 1, 1 and the word was God. They have to change the meaning of God within a, a half a breath. So, God in John 1.1c, 1, 1 and the word was God, that God is the Father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. It's the Father in Jesus. The Father dwells in Jesus. The Word, that's Jesus, he was God, the Father, speaking. And the Word, Jesus, was God at work. Like Jesus said, the words I speak are not mine, but the Father's. The Father in me does his works. When we read the Gospel of John, we don't hear Jesus telling us that he is another God distinct from the Father, a God the Son or a God the Word. Rather, Jesus tells us over and over in this Gospel that the God in Jesus is the Father. God's Word is not literally God. But the Word is the channel through which or through whom God does things. Perhaps one way of illustrating this would be if you have a Bible, you take the Bible and you hold it up and say, this is the Word of God, right? This is the Word of God. Yes. Trinitarian deity of Christ, people will say, yes, that's the Word of God. And then you put it down, you point at it, and you say, is that God not literally, God is not literally paper and ink. That's not his substance. That's not his essence. Paper and ink is not God's being. But in some way, you can understand that the Bible, the Word of God, is God. Because God's Word is the record, the evidence of God at work. The historical record in the Bible, the Word, was God revealing himself to Israel and to all humanity. Instead of interpreting the Logos, the word was God, in an ontological way, meaning that the Logos had a divine nature, what does this mean if we can look at the Bible, paper and ink, and declare that was God? The Logos was God can be understood in other ways. Instead of a declaration about the divine nature of the Logos, consider the idea that 
the Logos was God, is a statement about God in action, or God at work. God's word was God because it's God at work. And with Jesus, God's word, the Logos, was God because he was God in action, God at work. So here are four other ways that the Logos was God can be understood in the sense of God at work. And I think probably all of these ways the man Jesus Christ is in a certain way or was God. First, the Logos was God could be understood as God's presence. God is present in the Word of God. Secondly, the Logos is the power of God. We see that the Word of God has power. It changes people's lives. It gives new life. A person can be born again through the Word. So the Logos, the Word of God, is the power of God. Thirdly, the Logos was also the manifestation of God. The Word shows God, reveals God. We perceive God in the Word. We understand He's there. He's revealing himself to us in the Word. And another way to understand that the Word was or is God is that the Word represents God. This is agency. This is God giving his Word, sending his Word that represents God. The man Jesus of Nazareth, in the biblical sense of being sent, that means empowered and commissioned by God, the man Jesus of Nazareth, was sent by God, and he represents God. Jesus is said to be sent some 40 times in John's Gospel. So he represents God. Jesus said, Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Who sent Jesus? The Father. So to receive Jesus is to receive God, the Father. Jesus said, Whoever sees me has seen God the Son. No, sorry, I couldn't resist. Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. The Father in me does his works. John 14, 9 through 20. This is agency. This is representation. This is the presence of God. The Word was God in these various ways. I would suggest that interpreting the word was God, understanding the phrase the Logos was God, that Jesus was God in action. These ways that I've just listed, presence, power, manifestation, representation, or agency, this is the way that a biblical thinker would interpret the phrase. What do I mean by that? In the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, God, the only God, the Father, he, not they, made himself, not themselves, known through people and through circumstances many times in these different ways. The Israelites could know that was God by what happened, by how God acted through people and circumstances. Since we have the biblical framework, we can see what the author means because we already know that it was God who turned the waters of the Nile into blood. What? Wasn't that Moses and Aaron that struck the Nile River? Yes, but God did it. So Moses and Aaron were his agents. They were the means by which he did this. Who brought the Israelites out of Egypt? Was it Moses or was it God? Moses was God's agent. Moses was God's representative. He was an indication of God's presence and power. But the power is God's. So God brought Israel out of Egypt and through the Reed Sea. The presence of God was known, understood, and perceived then. Who defeated the Canaanites in the Promised Land? Who removed the Canaanites from the Promised Land? Was that Joshua or was that God? The Bible says God brought Israel. Israel into the promised land. Well, I thought that was Joshua. No, it was God that did that. The Bible actually says that Yahweh, yud God, slew King Saul. God killed King Saul. What? I thought Saul was killed by the Philistines up on Mount Gilboa. 
Well, God killed King Saul. That was God. So this is the biblical way of understanding the presence and the power, the manifestation of God, that God is represented and he does things through humans in many cases and circumstances too. This is the way that a biblical thinker, I would suggest the Jewish audience that received this writing in the first place, this is the way they would understand that something or somebody was God. The Logos was God at work. God's presence, his power, him manifesting in himself, the Logos is representing God. So John 1, 1c, the statement, the word was God, it's not an ontological statement about being, like the Gentile church fathers beginning in the second century started to take it, and most Christians still take it today. It's interesting how Westerners, probably fair to say descendants of Greek and Latin thinkers, we can't seem to understand the phrase was God in some other way other than being about the essence or the being of the Logos. But rather, when Jesus spoke, God, that is the Father, spoke, not God the Son. When Jesus healed the sick or raised the dead, the Father was at work healing the sick and raising the dead. When Jesus was raised from the dead, the Father was at work in him. God is the source of his word. And now in the new creation in the Gospel of John, Jesus is the word. But the word itself is not the source. The source is the Father. It's God. God is behind his word, you might say. He's the one who sends it out. He's the one who speaks it. We don't literally see God, but we perceive and understand that this was God at work through his word. You can see this parallel as well. You have confirmation in the, in the epistles of Paul, for instance, in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, where Paul says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us this ministry of reconciliation, that is... God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. So God, that's, this is the Father, this is not the Trinity, this is not God the Son, this is God, the Father, was in Christ, in the Messiah, reconciling the world to himself. This is the kind of thing that the Gospel of John is saying. It's the Father in Jesus that makes John say the word was God. Now. Let me mention some more reasons why the Gospel of John, why the author of the Gospel of John calls the man Jesus the Word. Several reasons, but among them, as we just describe all these other ideas of the presence of God and the power of God in his Word. But this Gospel especially has Jesus simply speaking and things come to be. Through the spoken words of Jesus, which are the words of the Father. There's a renewal of creation. John chapter 5, there's a man who's lame. He's been lame for 38 years. And Jesus comes and simply speaks, get up. He doesn't touch him. He doesn't put his hand on him. No hocus pocus and potions and so forth, anything like that. He simply speaks. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is God's channel through which God brings about renewal. And healing. Compare Psalm 107, verse 20. People were sick, and they cried out to Yudhevavhe, to God. And then, quote, He sent forth his word, and he healed them, and delivered them from destruction, unquote. Likewise, God sent the man Jesus, the word, and healed people. God was at work healing through his word. And Jesus can speak and the dead come out. Simply his voice. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man came alive. Like Jesus said, John chapter 5, verse 25, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice, the Son of God, 
and those who hear will live. So the power of God is in Jesus. It's in his spoken voice. This is the reason that the author can call Jesus the word. God is at work through him to renew, to recreate, to bring things about, to make things happen. And the author saw this in Jesus. And this is one of the reasons that Jesus is called the word here in the beginning of this gospel. And another reason that Jesus is the word is because it's the creation of new life that comes through him. When God spoke, things came to be. And with Jesus, through Jesus, things come to be. But again, the word is not the source of this creation, but he's God's instrument or channel. God is the source. God's word is not the source. Saying that the word was God is another way of saying that it was the Father in Jesus who spoke and did the works. See John 10, 38, 14, 10. You can see the same thing in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 22. Jesus is a man attested by God through whom God did mighty works. Now, I mentioned that John chapter 1, the word was with God and was God. The parallel is really with Moses. You can listen to the other podcast on that. Moses in the book of Exodus was with God and even is God, just like here, the Logos in John 1.1. 1, 1. So note that Jesus is compared to Moses, God's representative, in the prologue, chapter 1, verse 17. The Torah was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus the Messiah. So in John 1.17, Jesus is not the source of grace and truth. God is the source. And just like Moses was God's channel to bring the good Torah, the good teaching, how to get life, even so Jesus is God's channel for grace and truth. Jesus is compared to Moses. They're both God's representatives through whom God works. Not that they're ontologically, in essence, God or something like that, but they are the ones sent by God through whom God works. Now, in verses 9 through 13, in those verses it's important to remember that the word world, it's cosmos in Greek, doesn't mean the physical planet Earth, nor the universe, like we use the word today, cosmos, to mean all the universe. But in the Gospel of John, and in other places in the Bible, but especially in the Gospel of John, this word is used to refer to human society, or a segment of human society. And in the Gospel of John, that segment of human society, the world that Jesus came into, was Israelite society, and probably even specifically in some cases, Judean society, his own, Jesus' own are the Judeans. It's the Judeans that rejected him. But many of the other Israelites in Galilee, even in Samaria and across the Jordan, they received Jesus. So we don't have the creation of physical planet Earth in John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. These verses are about a new community of God coming to be. It's about getting a new birth and being born of God. Note how verses 9 through 11 lead up to verses 12 to 13. Verses which concern becoming a child of God, to be born of God. Again, John chapter 1 is not describing the creation of the physical world, seas, dry land, animals, plants. Rather, it's about the coming to be of people the birth of the community of the children of God. So to emphasize, the word world, cosmos, in John 1, 9 and 1, 10, it's not the universe or the physical planet Earth. The world, the cosmos, in these verses and in this gospel is a segment of human society. Again, once a person realizes that the prologue of John is not about the physical universe creation, one can understand that this is talking about the creation of life for newborn people, the children of God, the redemption 
of the people of God. And then John 1.14, and the word became flesh. This verse, the deity of Christ interpretation, takes as the idea of an incarnation, that, quote, God became man, or to be more specific in their understanding, that one member of a multi-personal God became man. But and that gets tricky. They usually will instead use language like God took on human flesh or added another nature or entered into flesh, these kinds of things. So even though they at first used the word became man, or became flesh, it's another thing they don't usually like to say became flesh. They'll change that to he became man. In a lot of ways, once one just scratches below the surface a little bit, it's easy to see the problems with the deity of Christ's claim about John 1.14. It's maybe a little more difficult to explain what it really does mean. I'll give a couple suggestions in just a second. But again, I think if one can get out of the context of a Genesis creation, you're going to start to think of other possibilities for what this Jewish author is really saying. Is a Jewish author of the first century who believed that the man, Jesus, is the Messiah, really trying to say in a short phrase or two that the God of Israel is really two persons? So 114 means something different than the Trinitarian world says, or the deity of Christ world says. And a big part of that is this word became. We'll come back to the word became in just a minute. But the way I understand 114 is this is the beginning of the third paragraph in John's prologue. And this paragraph is a review or a restatement of what he's already said, but then he's expanding, just like a three-part harmony song. But here, the different paragraphs, the different harmonies are given successively. So he's repeating, he's reviewing what he already said, that the word is the human being. And he has been compared to and shown to be preeminent to John the baptizer. So if the man Jesus has already been introduced and compared with John the baptizer in verses 1 through 13, a short statement about conception or birth of Jesus here in 114 makes no sense. Keep in mind as well that the Gospel of John nowhere describes anything about a birth or conception of Jesus. So, as a review and expansion of what the author has already said, John 1.14 could be translated as, So, the Word was flesh and dwelt among us. Was flesh, that means the Word of God, in this particular case, is the human being, who we're going to learn is called Jesus of Nazareth. There's not a transformation from one nature to another here. Right? I don't believe in transgenderism, neither do I believe in transnaturism, transnatures. The Trinitarian deity of Christ, people really have to believe in transnature here if they think that this means that God literally became flesh, or God the Son took on human nature, or Jesus entered into human flesh. You see, that denies that Jesus is a real human person. If a pre-incarnate God the Son entered into human flesh. There's no human person then. And we know that this gospel states clearly that it was God the Father in the man Jesus, not God the Son. But to take on human flesh or to enter into human flesh are very different actions than becoming flesh. And the Greek word here does not mean to take on or to enter into. I think another good question for a Trinitarian friend, if he thinks John 1.14 says that God became flesh, is to ask the person, so your God is flesh. If your God became flesh, then he's flesh. Your God is flesh? So one really has to think about what this word became means. And it's a word that has lots of different meanings, and it's used five different ways in the prologue of the Gospel of John, like simply was or came. These are various ways in which this word can be translated. 
doesn't mean necessarily a transformation of nature. This is the way the deity of Christ believer, the Greek thinking person has taken it, that it means a transformation of nature. So to the deity of Christ believer, Jesus is a transnatured being. He's actually a non-binary, transnatured, not transgendered, but transnatured being. He's God, man together. It's like he could be male and female together. Deity of Christ believers really need to be confronted with their belief in the transnaturism or the transessence of one being to another. Do they condemn transgenderism but believe in transnaturism? Which is the greater boundary? The boundary between male and female or the boundary between God and man? So if we want to understand this word became as a change or transformation, there's no reason to take it as a transformation of essence or nature. Another possibility could simply mean a change of method. For instance, God spoke, God's word came in different ways in past times. For instance, we could say of Moses' day that the word was two tablets of stone. This is the way God's word was given. It was the methodology. In other times, God's word came in dreams and visions and sometimes an audible voice. But in the case with Jesus Christ, I believe the author of the Gospel of John is saying, we have a different situation, a unique situation. There's been a change in methodology. And this is stated quite clearly in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, where the author says, long ago, at many times and in various ways, God spoke right? There's God speaking his word. God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son. That's exactly what John chapter 1 verse 14 is saying. The word of God now is the human being. He's flesh. So if we're going to insist on this word became, it's the Greek word, again, from Ginnamai. If we're going to insist on this being a transformation, which I'm not totally convinced that it has to be, it can be translated simply as was or came. He showed up on this scene, a human being. God's word came this time as a human being in the days of the author. He recognizes that the man, Jesus, is the word of God. I'm not totally convinced a transformation is necessary here, but if you want to go with the idea of a transformation, just as viable is this transformation in how God has spoke. In the past times, various ways, now he has spoken to us through a son, the man, Christ Jesus. In addition, consider the possibility that to the Hebrew biblical mind, you and I also became flesh. Every single human being has become flesh. We've entered into the scene of human history. We've become flesh. Because anything that's flesh in the biblical mind, not in the Greek mind that misinterpreted this, the Greco-Roman Christian church fathers that misinterpreted this. But in the biblical mind, anything that's flesh is not God. We can know from the book of Genesis what or who was flesh, birds, animals, and man. God is not on that list. So a biblically-minded person, once he knows that something or someone is flesh, it's not God. It's a created being. Sure, as we saw in John 1.1, 1, 1, the word was God, the Father, in action. Right? It was God the Father in Christ Jesus. So this statement, the word became flesh, or the word was flesh, says exactly the opposite of what the Trinitarian world is saying. The word became flesh is declaring the word is not God, it's flesh, it's a human being. Then John 1.14 continues, the word dwelt among us. So here we're, we're first starting to get the experience of the author himself. He uses the plural pronoun us, that the word dwelt among us. So we have the personal testimony of the author. The word dwelt among us. It was the word dwelling among the people. The author sees that it was the word living among the people. The man Jesus was the word living among the people. And I think there probably is a parallel here with the tabernacle in the wilderness. 
that Jesus is a temple for God. Now, he's not God the Son inhabiting the fleshly body or something like that. But this is the Father who's in Jesus. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. As we've said before, it's God the Father who is in such a unique relationship, we can say he's in Jesus. Now, this word in doesn't mean ontologically. We can see that Jesus is a temple. He's like a tabernacle. Just like we are, believers are a temple of God. God is in us. We're his temple. But it doesn't mean that I am God. God in us doesn't mean we are ontologically God, right? My nature or something is God now. It's not what it means. Even the phrase in Christ, which is all over the New Testament, we are in Christ. It's a word that means relationship. To be in Christ means we have a relationship with Christ. God the Father in Jesus means he has a relationship with Jesus in a very unique way, in a very special way. And like there was a, a glory in the tabernacle and even associated with Moses, John goes on in this verse and says, we beheld his glory, glory as of a unique one or a unique son from the Father. There's a, a differentiation again between Jesus and the Father. The glory that Jesus has as the unique one was given to him by the Father. And then we can see that the author returns to the testimony of John the Baptist in verse 15. Jesus is preeminent over John. This is one of the points he's making throughout the prologue and in the rest of chapter 1. Just read the rest of the chapter 1 of John, starting in verse 19, and you can see that, hey, you know what? Maybe the prologue is about the relationship of Jesus and John the Baptizer, that Jesus is preeminent. Jesus is the one that's like Moses. Jesus is the one who was with God. Jesus was God, the Father, at work in very unique ways. We've already mentioned verse 17, where Jesus is parallel to Moses. Both Moses and Jesus were God's channels to bring good things. But the source of those things is God, the Father. Now let me talk about John 1.18. If we come back to the idea of the problems with the Trinitarian and deity of Christ interpretations of the prologue, let's start with the Trinitarian interpretation. My guess would be that most people we talk to about this are Trinitarian. So I think it's very important to say, okay, now hold on a second. You're going to John chapter 1 as your main evidence that God is a Trinity, your main evidence. Let's get a wider view here for a second. So God has not revealed himself as a Trinity it's going to be in this 43rd book of the Protestant biblical canon that all of a sudden we're going to learn that God is a trinity. You're going first to John chapter 1. This is your best chapter. You keep telling me, what about John chapter 1? What about John chapter 1? So this is the best chapter. But here's the problem. In John chapter 1, God is not a trinity. The word God is not a trinity, and nowhere is God a trinity in John chapter 1 even in the Trinitarian understanding of this chapter. So something might be wrong if your main chapter that you think shows that God is a Trinity is John chapter 1. Why come to this chapter? Isn't there a better chapter of Scripture that shows that God is a Trinity? Why didn't Jesus describe that God is Trinitarian in the Sermon on the Mount? Or somewhere, Paul, in the book of Romans, he's describing the relationship of Jews and Gentiles and the law, all these different topics. Somewhere he couldn't have explained to us that God is actually more than one person. So this is a big problem with the Trinitarian interpretation. Like I said, put the word Trinity anywhere in here for God and see if it makes sense. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with the Trinity, and the word was the Trinity. Or even if you don't like that, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with the Father, and the word was the Father. Again, a Trinitarian can't say or can't believe that the Word was the Father. So there's no Trinity. There's no mention of the Holy Spirit or a third person of God being three persons in one being or something like that. The God of John chapter 1 is not a Trinity. The God, the only God, the Father, is perceived in the words and works of the man Jesus. So 
in most Trinitarians' mind, what they're thinking is, okay, Jesus is God. So my best evidence for that is John chapter 1. But there's also big problems with the deity of Christ interpretation of John chapter 1. And in the last podcast, I mentioned these, but just in short, we can see that the word is subordinate to God in this chapter. And things come to be through him. Even if you think this is the Genesis creation, for instance, in verse 3, or the world that came to be through him in verse 10. Even if you think this is the Genesis creation, which it is not, but the word is subordinate to God. The word is not the source of this coming to be. Think about that. Your word is not its own source. It's dependent on you, on you speaking it. Your word may have a certain equality with who you are. It may be an expression of who you are. But your word is dependent on you. Your word had an origin. You. Even so, Jesus, the word, is dependent upon God. God is his origin. Jesus, he's the channel. He is participating, yes, but he is God's instrument, or he's God's channel through which this comes to be. And here we can take a look at John chapter 1, verse 18, which says that no one has ever seen God. If no one has ever seen God, then Jesus is not literally God. Yes, he manifests God. Yes, he represents God. But no one has ever seen God. So here is another indication that Jesus is not equal to God in essence or in his eternality. And then there's this famous textual variant in the rest of John 1.18. You can see the variance or the variation by just comparing English translations. Some English translations say like this, The only Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. Or the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. Now if Jesus is begotten, he's born. He's subordinate to the Father. Or if you want to take this as the other textual variant is that he's the begotten God, then he's still subordinate. He's begotten. He has an origin. Or if you want to take this as the unique God, the only God who is at the bosom of the Father, he's subordinate to the Father. Deity of Christ believers insist that Jesus is the same essence and co-eternal and co-equal to the Father. But that's not what John chapter 1 says. Jesus is consistently subordinate to God the Father. If anything, this would be interpreted that there are two gods, one greater God and one lesser God with a small g, like the second century Logos theorists, Justin Martyr, for example, understood Jesus to be. So for the deity of Christ interpretation, John chapter 1 is a failure. If you want to think that this is the Genesis creation here, and that Jesus is involved in the Genesis creation, he's subordinate. Things have come to be through him, but the source is the Father. God's not a trinity in John chapter 1, and the Word is the channel of what comes to be in John chapter 1. He's not the source. The Word, the Logos, is subordinate to God. And then finally, one other thing I think that's important is that we do need to know a little bit more about the context of the Gospel of John. And if we're going to have an interpretation of John chapter 1, verse 1 and 114 that contradicts or disagrees with the rest of the Gospel, something's wrong. So there are some other verses in the Gospel of John that I think are important to know. For instance, in John chapter 8, verse 40, Jesus says that he is a man who told the truth that he heard from God. If Jesus is God, he would never say that. Even if he was a God-man, he would never say that. And God here is the Father. And Jesus says continually in the Gospel of John that he did nothing on his own authority or his own initiative. John 5.19, 5.30, 8.28, 8.44, etc. He does nothing on his own initiative or on his own authority. A God person would never say that. He'd be lying. 
Jesus differentiates himself from God in the Gospel of John. For instance, John chapter 14, verse 1. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So he's not God in this Gospel. Jesus has a God in this Gospel. And the God of Jesus is the same God as the apostles. Remember John chapter 20, verse 17, which he said to Mary Magdalene? He told her, Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Jesus has a God in this gospel. His God is the same God as the apostles' God. And then Jesus, in the gospel of John, said that the Father is the only true God. John chapter 17, verse 3. And the author of this gospel actually gives us a purpose statement for the writing of his book. In chapter 20, verse 31, as he sums up, he says he recorded the signs that Jesus did so that his readers would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And the Son of God is a title of the king who's been appointed and designated and has a relationship with God. He's not God. So the writer tells us why he recorded the signs Jesus did. It's not so that we would believe that Jesus is literally God or that there's another God figure we must now believe in or that God is triune or something like that. That's not in this gospel. So I believe the author and I don't claim that I know better why the author wrote his book. He tells us why he recorded these miraculous signs that Jesus did. Not so that we would believe that Jesus is God, but rather so that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Thank you for listening to this episode on WLC Radio. We're living in very solemn times. The world is hovering on the brink of disaster. Catastrophic events will soon take place that will bring this age to a close and usher in the next. In His great mercy, Yahuwah has revealed through prophecy what the future holds. Revelation 8 foretells a series of events, each one worse than the last, that will devastate the earth. The world's food supplies will be decimated. Famine and its accompanying pestilence will result. The Earth's fresh water supplies will also be affected. Revelation 9 reveals that demons will impersonate extraterrestrials. The terror and devastation of this so-called alien invasion will make people desperate for safety at any cost. The freedom to live and worship as the conscience dictates will become a thing of the past. Many lives will be lost during this series of events, and when the mark of the beast is enforced, there will be martyrs. Each event prepares for the next crisis. In one long last call of mercy to repent, for Yahuwah is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Shortly following the events described in Revelation 8 and 9, the seven last plagues will be poured out. These plagues and the earlier trumpets will wreak havoc on the earth and cause unprecedented destruction and misery. Isaiah 24 warns, quote, Behold, Yahuwah maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. Unquote. For believers, however, there is hope. In describing the end of this age, Yahushua said in Luke 21 verse 28, quote, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Unquote. Yes, the end will be traumatic. It's meant to be. Yahuwah wants to save every individual he can, so he allows this final climax to awaken souls. But the gospel of the kingdom of Yah is that, beyond the traumatic events of the near future, an eternity of bliss awaits all who accept Yah's gift of salvation. 
When Yahushua returns, all who've died trusting in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior will be raised back to life in the first resurrection. Yahushua will then set up Yah's kingdom on earth. He and the redeemed will reign jointly on the earth for the first thousand years of eternity. John saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. If you wish to join with the redeemed of all ages, living a life that measures with the life of Yahuwah, make the choice. Accept salvation today. You don't have to get yourself ready. The truth is, you can't. Neither can I. No one can. Come to Him just as you are. Don't wait until you've quit sinning. You're not going to get better through your own efforts. Accept Yahuwah's invitation to become a member of His eternal earthly kingdom. When you accept this precious invitation, Yahuwah will gift you with a brand new heart. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26, he declares, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Accepting this priceless gift is the only way for joining his kingdom. Come to Yahuwah just as you are. He's waiting with arms wide open, eager to receive all who come to Him. If you're enjoying WLC Radio, invite your friends to listen in too. If you know someone interested in last day events or you have a Bible study partner, tell them about our website, worldslastchance.com. You have been listening to WLC Radio. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31-meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return.